Now it's time for the game that no one has been waiting for. It's Christmas trivia that you maybe never knew. This is going to be something fun we're going to be doing throughout the season of Advent that we're going to take every week. We're going to have a new set of questions all about Christmas just to see how much you know about where this crazy holiday came from and all the things that kind of surround it. So we're going to start off this week with some great questions and uh, how this is going to work. And we put the uh, question up so you can see the question. There's going to be some answers. I'll have a chance to answer that and figure it out. And then we'll kind of talk about that for just a second afterwards and, and we'll see how well we do. So take a look. Here is our first question for this week. It is this. What year it was Jesus born? If you guess 6 BC, you are, well, maybe correct. Uh, that's our best guess, actually, of the year that Jesus was born, uh, because that uh, we don't really know. Um, because, and we know that it's got to be maybe around then, because it can't be any later than that, because we know when Herod died. Herod died in 4 BC. And so for everything to take place, probably around 6 BC or so uh, is, our best, is our best guess. Um, but there, there have been many attempts to date Jesus' birth uh, going back a long time. We're going to get into those in just a second. So let's go to our second question today, and that is, when was Christmas first celebrated? Take a look at your options and see what you come up with. you've never thought to ask yourself that question before, uh, you might have been completely lost as to when that was going to happen. But the uh, about the first time we really start to have some records of when uh, Christmas was being celebrated uh, was about 336 AD. So like we're talking a few centuries after Jesus' birth. And then, uh, and that was then when it was declared a feast day, uh, but not really a but it wasn't really celebrated as a as a holiday so much. It would be much later before we'd actually get to the Christ Mass. That's two separate words: the Christ Mass, which was a a mass that was celebrated on December twenty fifth, um, and then from later we would kind of smash those things together and we would get the word Christmas. All right, so let's go to our third question. Our third question now is: What day was Jesus born on? Think about that one carefully. Now I have to say this one really is a tricky one to answer because we we legitimately do not know, do not have any sort of clue, even as a best guess of uh, when, uh, what day Jesus would have been born on. Uh, there's a, for a long time, it was thought January 6th, uh, the day we normally celebrate as Epiphany, was uh, was his birthday. Uh, then for a long time, March 25th was considered his birthday. That is the same time back in the day when uh, they would celebrate the the solar, uh, let me make sure I get my, the spring equinox, excuse me, the spring equinox was on March 25th. And that was a, a time in the ancient world that symbolized recreation or rebirth. So you can see why folks might have thought that that would have been a good time. Uh, but strangely enough, nine months from March 25th, we actually get December 25th, which lined up with a bunch of other things things. Uh, and so it meant that March 25th could be celebrated as kind of the, the, uh, the announcement of Jesus' birth, and then his birth could actually take place on December 25th. But like I said, all of that is just kind of supposition on the part of folks that came later. We really don't have any idea when or what day Jesus was born. We don't know much about the birthday or the birth year uh, from when Jesus was born. We only have two uh, passages in all of Scripture that really go in depth about, about Jesus' birth, and they don't really agree on a whole lot as you look at those stories, but that's okay. Uh, what's important isn't the, isn't the celebration of the specifics. 
I think sometimes we can get caught up in that, and that's not at all what's important about Christmas. Uh, but it's that we celebrate this at all, that we celebrate what Jesus did, that he came into this world to show us a new path. We celebrate Christmas on December 25th for a lot of reasons. But what's most important is that we do actually celebrate his birth and his coming into the world. I have to admit that I had a little bit of fun in uh, putting together that little bit of trivia. I mean, who doesn't think of Christmas and game shows and all of those things going together, right? I, okay, yeah, I mean, that's a little weird. Uh, but, you know, I thought, hey, it might be fun this year. Do something a little bit different. And kind of also to see how much you all know about Christmas. I know that I have learned a lot over the last month or, month or two as I've been getting ready for all of this. Uh, but so that we're going to continue doing that every week just for a bit of fun and a bit of uh, just kind of seeing what we know. Now, I know that's not a normal thing to do, and that's okay, because this is going to be for us a very different Christmas. For this season, I wanted to take us back to a different time and to begin to reset our expectations for Christmas and to know that traditions come and go and that change is okay, because at the center of everything is still Jesus Christ come into the world to show us a better way. When Jesus was born, it was into a very different sort of world than the one that we are a part of now. Now, the popular thought is that when he was born, he was born in this transition from the way that we number things from, uh, from B.C. to A.D., and that he was kind of at that hinge moment. Um, but we have since changed the way that we refer to how we, how we, number, how we, how we number the years for these things. So it's instead of B.C., we say B.C.E., that's before Common Era, and C.E., that's the Common Era, because there's this whole mess in trying to figure out dating and how things happened. And, and it wasn't just Jesus' birth that caused a lot of this trouble, because there's been a lot of issue over the years of when it was that Jesus was born. But one of the other things was is... Uh, for a long time, we didn't know what to do with zero. There was no such thing as a zero. And so numbering things, especially if we're going from BCE to CE, gets really kind of confusing. But as we've discussed before in part of the trivia, uh, Jesus was born sometime probably before about 4 BCE. Maybe around 6 BCE, could have been a little bit after that, but somewhere around that time to the best of our understanding. And he was born to a marginalized group of people that were under the control of others and that weren't a part of the Roman Empire that most people didn't really know about probably didn't even really care all that much about, except for one really important part of who they were, which is that they were a transition point from the Mediterranean Sea to land, from the main part of the empire shipping goods over water onto land routes that would take them far off to the east. Now, to kind of get a feel for what that would be like, think of some place like Louisiana, Missouri. I don't know if any of you have ever been to Louisiana. Uh, when we were in Bowling Green, we were about 10 miles west of Louisiana. And Louisiana is this great little town. It's got a lot of history, but it is a small town right on the Mississippi River. And uh, for all that it has going for it, it's not very well known, except that it has a bridge over the Mississippi River. That bridge is one of the very few that are in this part of the state that can get people from Missouri to Illinois and continue that transition from one place to the next. But it is otherwise a relatively unknown place by just about everyone else. It's into this kind of place that Jesus is born. Now, this wouldn't have been the kind of the place probably that the prophet Isaiah was thinking of when in uh, chapter 64, verses 1 and 2 of the book of Isaiah, uh, Isaiah said, makes this statement. He says, If only you would tear open the heavens and come down, mountains would quake before you like fire igniting brushwood or making water boil. 
If you would make your name known to your enemies, the nations would tremble in your presence. Isaiah 64, verses 1 and 2. Kind of where things were located would not have been the expected place for something great and amazing like that to happen. Or even we can take the book of Revelation that even though John of Patmos probably would have been at least maybe passingly familiar with the birth stories of Jesus that we read about in Matthew and Luke's Gospels, um, he probably, if he were allowed to go back and rewrite those stories, Israel would not have been the place that he would have chosen to be the start of this journey that ends in this place in Revelation 21. Because if he were doing the choosing, he might not choose such an unexpected place as, as, uh, as Israel. It just didn't quite seem to fit in. Uh, look at what he says in Revelation 21. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be their God. Such crazy, amazing, powerful words that start in this unexpected place. Some would look at that unexpected place and they would look at it and say, well, God, your dwelling place is, uh, I don't know how to tell you this, but it's a little bit of a fixer-upper. Maybe if you go find Chip and Joanna Gaines, maybe a little bit of shiplap here and there, that you might be able to get things fixed up so it looks like all these grand descriptions that you're going to give to it, either from the prophet Isaiah or that will come uh, later from John of Patmos. Uh, but for right now, it's kind of a shabby place. Maybe you should talk to someone about this. And yet, it's into this unexpected place that God comes. God defies all of the expectations and he turns traditions on their heads when he is doing all of these things. And yet, as we read the stories, at the same time that it feels like he is doing all those things, what we really see him doing, when we really stop to look at it and see, is that God is neither defying expectations nor is he turning traditions on their head. What he's really doing is he's straightening everything out. And he's helping the others to really understand what's going on and helping them to see the world for the creation that he made it to be. It's into this that he shows us hope. Something that had been missing for far too long in the world that Jesus was born into, but also feels at times like is missing from our world today. So the solution kind of for this, where we're going with this, is that this year, I don't know if you all have noticed this, but there's like this rush to try and be as quote unquote normal uh, as possible. Which is completely understandable in this very unsettled and trying time that we are a part of. But trying to be normal won't make anything better. This is a year when, because of that, it is okay to defy expectations. It's okay uh, to search out what is maybe most important. But that means intentional work on our part. In a year that is already trying us, we want things to be back to the way they were. But knowing at some point inside of ourselves that they can't be there, if we want to come through this time, then we have to intentionally seek out what will make it different. To so intentionally search out what God is doing in this time. Now to help us along that way, we're going to be using uh, what's called the Christmas Pledge. This comes from a book called uh, Unplug the Christmas Machine. And it is meant to help us to focus on Christmas and to find structure in an unsettled time. Because really that's the thing that we're missing, finding that structure to help us be able to prop ourselves up and begin to build something through this time. That's what we're really looking for. And it's not going to happen by falling back on what we know, but that will happen by leaning into the unsettled time that we're in to rediscover who we are. 
Advent starts a new Christian year. And so it's with that in mind that our, that where we're looking at for this season is a new year, new traditions, and a renewed faith. And that starts with pieces that help us begin to figure this out. And so there are the five points to uh, this Christmas pledge. And the first one is this, to remember those people who truly need my gifts. Two, to express my love for family and friends in more direct ways than presents. Three, to rededicate myself to the spiritual growth of my family. Four, to examine my holiday activities in light of the true spirit of Christmas. Five, to initiate one act of peacemaking within my circle of family and of friends. This week, I want us to take some time to reflect on this pledge. There is, whether you're looking at the order of service on our website or you're on YouTube or Facebook, there is inside of that a link to uh, to a copy of this uh, of this Christmas pledge, as well as a number of other resources to kind of help us find that structure through this time. And I invite you to take a look at those uh, and to reflect more on this. And when you're ready, I want you to take I want you to do something else. Each week I'm going to have uh, what I'm calling the big questions or the big challenges for uh, for this week. And so the first one that I want you to try and answer for this week is. What do you spend the most time doing? I know this is a very busy season for all of us during Christmas. And so the question really is, what do you spend your mo the most time doing in this time? And then I want you to answer the next question that comes from that. Is it worth it? Is spending that much time doing whatever that thing is or things are, it could be several things that, uh, that are a part of that, is it worth spending that time? And then follow that with another question. What do you really want to spend time doing? Do you want to spend a lot of time decorating, but would rather be making Christmas cookies instead? Do you spend a lot of time wrapping gifts, but you know, you'd really rather be curled up on the couch watching a movie with your kids? Those things and those kinds of places. What are your trade-offs there? Now, ask yourself this question. This one, and this one I think is the hardest one. This is the one that I want us to really get to, and that is, what does your family think is most important? Now, this is a conversation I want us to have with our families and ask that question. What do you all think is most important? Now, you've got to be prepared for this, though, because um, this has to be a kind of a judgment-free time because you might find that your family thinks they want to do, they, they think something else is completely more important than where we spend all of our time doing. But in the same vein, make sure that you prepare your family also to hear your response in that when you're saying, well, no, this is what's important to me. And I say this is a judgment-free zone because these are important conversations to have as we come into this Christmas season and into this unsettled time. Because what happens in this time is, is that we begin to make those trade-offs where we choose one set of things over another. And we have to see, well, what is this actually going to mean for us? And so when you have your answers... Then I want you to do this. I want you to give yourself permission to make changes and to lean into the things that you found. It may be that some of the things you that a lot of the things you're doing that you're going to keep doing and you and your family loves and you love and it is a great time together and that's wonderful. It may also be that you learn some things and so you shift what you're doing and how you're doing. But most importantly, you know now what it is that is most important for you and for your family as you go through this time. And remember that through all of this, God did the unexpected thing. He sent his son into the world, into one of the most unlikely places around, and that has made all of the difference for us and for the world that we're a part of. 
I want you to take a few moments now before uh, before we come to uh, uh, before we come to the benediction, and there'll be just a little bit of music playing for just a short time, and I invite you to uh, uh, to reflect on kind of these big questions and where we're going, and you may maybe even begin to start making your plan for how you're going to get to uh, something different going forward. Having begun the time and process of reflection, hearing the questions and knowing that God works in the unexpected places. Let us go from here, from this time of worship. Let us go knowing that God has come into the world and that that makes all the difference. And let us go with the words from an Advent hymn that we're going to hear a lot through this season, but continue to challenge us even now. Let us go with these words. O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel that mourns in lonely exile here until the Son of God appear. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. Amen, and go in peace.